Then in the middle, there's some really clear stuff about the, the kinds of people we want in our education system. And increasingly, uh, again, McKinsey published a report in this country called The Talent Gap about two or three months ago, where we looked at a whole, we, we compared the, the stock of teachers and the people coming into teaching in the US with other successful countries. Uh, and we did that back in 2007 with our report comparing system, the top 10 systems in the world uh, back then. The great systems in the world are recruiting really good people into teaching all the time, people with high academic qualifications and the human qualities that make a great teacher, not one or the other, both. Canada's good at this, Finland's good at this, Singapore's brilliant at this. They adjust their pay for teachers according to a basket of indicators of what is happening to pay in other professions that they want to make sure they match or exceed. So teachers are paid slightly more, for example, than civil servants, and that's constantly uh, ratcheted uh, in that connection. So that Singapore is recruiting the top 30% of the graduate cohort in Finland. It's about the top 10%. And we're nowhere near that in the UK, but we have made real progress in the last 10 years in that direction, and the US has a real challenge here. So this is very, very important. And the training them well is important because a lot of teacher education isn't really related to the teacher, to the things you need to learn to be a great teacher. Um, so that's a big issue, um, big challenge for the US. And then once teachers are teaching, once they've joined the profession, do they continuously get better? Can they say year after year, I'm a better teacher now than I was last month or last year, and next year I'll be even better? The evidence in the US suggests that teachers improve for the first three years and then plateau for 37 years. What kind of career is that? This is, um, this is just not, um, it's, it's neither rewarding for the teachers nor is it good for the children. We want people who are continuously improving and there's lots of evidence from systems about how you do that. It's about how you organize the school. It's about teachers planning lessons together, looking at student work together. It's about coaching and mentoring. It's not uh, a lot about going to courses and it's certainly not, um, sadly from my point of view, about people reading books. It's about, it's about really focusing, using the data, connecting it in, having this kind of debate among the staff in the school, sometimes with experts coming in from outside and doing the coaching in the math strategy that Dave Reynolds in, um, uh, brought into it in England and the literacy one that, uh, that I was responsible for. We had expert coaches, people brought out of the teaching profession who went and coached and modeled and invited teachers to come and see them teach their lessons. They were called leading math teachers or literacy expert teachers. These, these are the kinds of programs that really make a difference. Um, so getting that right, it's not very exciting from a policymaker, particularly a politician's point of view, but it is absolutely fundamental. And then there's a school leadership question, the quality of school leadership. The data shows again and again that the second biggest influence after the quality of the teacher is the quality of the school leader. So getting the school leaders right. Um, I know this is a big issue for the, for the Kern Foundation uh, and for many others, uh, is very, very important. But you can only get this right if you give the school leader the discretion to do the job. Um, it's no good making a school leader a, a principal accountable if they have no power over what happens in their school. They've got to be able to change the circumstances, they've got to be actually manage, they've got to be able to manage the people and the resources, and then they've got to have the skills to do that. Uh, and again, there's some great examples. Singapore's done a fantastic job of this. England's actually done a wonderful job of this in the last uh, five years or so really working hard on how to improve leaders. And then as people get better at being a school leader, giving them wider system responsibility. So in England now you can be the, the principal of one school and you can literally take over other schools and you can run five, six, or uh, I think in one case even seven schools uh, as, as a kind of cluster. Not necessarily geographically co-located either. They can be spread. So in a, in a sense, one way of looking at that is you're generating a charter chain from within the system.